thanks for inviting me here. I was going to talk, uh, first of all, my, my name is Don Sackett. I'm the, one of the founders and the CEO of this company called PSYOPS. We're outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And this is my third, yeah, third, third uh, new business in this field of handheld instruments. Um, the last two we've we had for about 10 years, sold them off to large instrumentation companies and um, got bored playing golf, so we decided to start a new one. So this is what we're doing here. So what I was going to talk about today, is, I'm a physicist by education, uh, but I've been working in instrumentation for 20 something years. I'm not a geochemist, so if you have mineral questions, I'm not sure I can help you with those, but ask away and I'll, if I can't, if I don't have the answer, I'll try to get it for you. Um, but that's who I am. Um, so what I was going to talk about today is kind of an overview of some new handheld technology. Not so much to promote any specific thing, it's not the intent, just kind of an update of what's out there now and and, and along the lines of what Rob was saying about speed things up, what's new and, is, and, and we're working on getting accepted. And I'm going to answer your question in about two slides. Um, so the, the subject is in-field geochemistry. Um, and what we've been doing in this field for portable instruments for the last, 50, last 20 plus years is two things. Either looking at bulk samples, meaning a whole rock, or a whole core, a ground up rock, and either looking for total elemental content in that thing, like how much copper, how much nickel, how much manganese, et cetera, et cetera, or looking at that material and with a different technique and trying to determine what's the mineral or mix of minerals in that material. And that's what we've been doing. In, um, and there's essentially two very well established technologies to do that. One is handheld x-ray, x-ray fluorescence or XRF, which is sensitive to the total elemental content. And what I've seen over the, you know, what we hear back from our customers is what they really want is quantitative in, uh, in the field, instant mineral identification and how much is that, what percentage of mineral is in that rock. That's what they really want. And that's what we've been trying to work towards getting them over these last 20 plus years. But right now, with x-ray, it'll give you the total elemental, and all you guys have seem to have come quite good at, if you know how much copper or nickel is in a, a rock, figuring out if that's something that's valuable to continue to explore or extract. And then there's the, um, the handheld near-infrared technology that's sensitive to mineral content as opposed to elements. We don't, this, this product is called the Halo. We don't make it. We, it's not really a competitor because they're very, um, complimentary. I know these guys that pan analytical quite well. So, uh, and I made a few. I have a few comments about the halo going forward that aren't meant to be disparaging in any way. If, but if they're inaccurate, please, you know, let me know. It wasn't the intent. Um, so for X-ray, again, sticking with what's been happening, sort of the uh, the 1950s pit pit crew story. Um, it's a very well established technique. Limits of detection down in the 3 to 10 ppm range, typically. You know, they do vary by the sample type. Like I said, all you guys have learned how to really correlate that into useful information. Um, the problem with it is that it, it really interrogates a bulk area of one or two square centimeters. It's not a, a, like a pinpointing technology. Uh, it's not sensitive to light out to what, what we call the low atomic number elements, basically hydrogen to sodium. And it's only modestly sensitive to uh, some of the low, low atomic number transition elements, like aluminum, magnesium. And it's not at all sensitive to mineral species. And it also, there's this dilution effect. Because the, the, uh, the analysis window is a few square centimeters, when you, if you put it on a rock or a, or a rock face, what you're really getting, you know, usually that mineral in there is in a form of a vein or maybe an inclusion. It's you know, maybe hundreds of microns. But what you're getting is an average analysis over several square centimeters. So that, in a, that essentially dilutes the signal from that particular material you're looking for. All right. Flipping over to, so X-ray elemental, flipping over to near infrared, which is mineral sensitive. Um, I threw in a typical NIR, that's you know, something, you know, dolomite. 
So with NAR, you get these stretches, which are basically vibrations in the bonds of the mineral. So when you shoot an unknown material, what the way these things work is they, you, you get this pattern, and that pattern gets matched up to a library of signatures, and the analyzer does its best to try to, to deduce what mineral is present. Um, they try to do binary mixtures, but it's really, I think, and again, the, the technology is really at the point of if you can see a binary mixture of minerals, it's going to be a lot of this, a little bit of that. It's not, not very quantitative, not yet. So that's really the, you know, the, the, good, the, the plus about the NIR spectroscopy is it does give you mineral information. The negative is that um, it's very much, I think, still a very qualitative tool, and it requires a fair amount of it, it, a fair, it requires a fairly skilled user to, to interpret the data. It's not, not so easy to, to look at these kind of patterns and you know, just trust some mathematical algorithm that tries to say, okay, this, this mixture of, of spectral fingerprints, when combined together, yields this pattern because often you get nonsensical types of answers from, without having some human uh, knowledge intervention on that. Anyway, so that's, that's, the, that's, uh, that's what's been going on the last 20, 25 years is us instrumentation companies have been plodding along, trying to make handheld incrementally, x-ray incrementally better and, and near-infrared incrementally better. And with some success, the technologies have certainly progressed. Um, what, in fact, so we have that technology, but the main reason we started this business, um, or this business, this segment of the business, about four years ago was to make, come out with a new technology, which is historically known as LIBS, which stands for laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. LIBS is an elemental technique, so it's not mineral, it is elemental. Um, it's been used as a benchtop analyzer. It's used in a benchtop form factor for probably the past 50 years. So what we did is we miniaturized it from a tabletop uh, piece of equipment down to a handheld battery operated piece of equipment. Um, and it's an optical technique, not x-ray. So the way it works is it fires a pulsed laser at the, at the rock, and the laser is roughly 100 microns in diameter, so it's very much a pinpoint. Fires a pulsed laser, and that vaporizes in some of that material into a plasma. As that plasma cools, it gives off optical light, which we measure, and we know each element has certain optical emissions, so by measuring how much light you get at a certain wavelength, you can deduce what elements are there and, and what concentrations are there. That's how it works. Now, to kind of jump back to your question, Nathan, about rate of adoption, um, it, it is very much true, not only in mining, but, but you know, oil and gas tends to be more conservative, so whenever you're introducing these kind of technologies, um, I mean, let's face it, especially, I think, the last several years where capital budgets have really been limited, it's very hard for somebody to justify taking a, a chance on a new technology. Right? If you have $30,000 to spend <coughs> on a field analyzer, probably you're going to either buy an x-ray or a near-infrared because you probably know 200 other geologists that all use them, generally like them, and that's, that's the road. So it's that is really, the, I think, the single biggest thing to adopting a new technology. So what we do and what we've been doing is we've had these units out on studies and field trials with some of the bigger operators, the Rio Tintos and the BHBs. And, and it's just been a question of generating re data, research, publications. You know, you get a few of them into mining sites and then a few more. But it really is, that is, uh, that is the fact of the matter is it does take, you know, to, to, for a, a, a technology that's new to become established, um, probably takes a good five, six, seven years. Um, but you know that going in because we've done it two times before. And it was the same with X-ray back in the, X-ray was introduced really in the early 90s into the mining industry, handheld X-ray, and it wasn't until early 2000s that there was probably several thousand of those sold in any given year into the, into the uh, metals exploration industry. Anyway, so that's the story there. <clears throat> but that's the technology. Um, that's not that, 
I have no idea why I included this slide. Um, that's what a spectrum looks like. <clears throat> Just to show you, it is kind of a mess. There's many, many lines from a typical rock with 20 or 30 different elements. The, the, one of the advantages of the laser technology over the x-ray is that you, you can measure every element in the periodic table from hydrogen to uranium. Not that you want to try to measure 92 elements in a single shot, but you can if you need to. So that allows you, when you start thinking about a mineral where you can imagine there's many minerals that have most of the elements are the same. Maybe they have one or two unique ones if you're comparing them. If you have many minerals, if you can't measure some of those unique elements with x-ray, you can't distinguish those minerals. If you can measure every element with a technique like laser, maybe you can. <clears throat> so the laser technology is sensitive to elements, complete periodic table coverage. Uh, the laser is about a hundred micron diameter beam, maybe a little smaller. So you can really think about pinpointing on a certain vein or a certain spot on the rock. Um, <clears throat> so that's the big question that we hope will be answered in the next couple of years, which is, you know, is it, is it the technique that, that can really deliver what the, what the industry has been asking us for, which is, give me something I can take into the field, shoot a, take a rock, find a spot on the rock, shoot it, and it tells me what percentage is, name your, min name your mineral. I don't know any minerals, so I can't name one. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Dolomite, I know that one. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, if you, you know, metals and alloys, I can talk to you all day long about that, but my, uh, my biz dev guy for mining was, uh, he, he's tied up in Australia, actually on some of these trials, so uh, your guys are stuck with me. So how, how does the, how the LIBS works? Um, it has, first of all, it has, like cell phones, it has a, a nice high resolution camera. So when you put the rock onto the analyzer, on the display, you see a, a nice high resolution image and you can move the rock around and you can find the exact spot you wanna shoot. What I've learned about you guys is that you seem to kinda know, if you look at a rock, you seem to know where you wanna test on that rock like my uh, mining colleagues, they'll take a rock and they'll look at some, in, some pattern on that rock and they'll say, oh, that's vanadium and that's this and that's titanium. And I'm thinking, why do you even need an analyzer if you can do that? But um, I don't know. Maybe that's why it's been so slow to adopt. They really just don't, they just don't need the product. So, but um, uh, anyway, so we have a camera. You can look at the finest spot. There's a little white light that shines and shows you where that laser is going to hit so you can move it around. You can't do that with x-ray because you can't have your fingers near there. Um, well, you can, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, and then you shoot it and then you get that elemental spectrum that we showed earlier. And we have a, and then there's a mineral library that it'll, it'll try to match that up to and say the following two minerals are uh, are what comprise this spectrum that I've, I've measured. Remember this thing. So there's some mathematics going on inside there. And the goal is to try to do quantitative binary mixtures for now. I got 70% of mineral A. If I knew a mineral, I'd tell you what A was, and I have 30% of mineral B. And if we can do that in a few seconds in the field without having to have a PhD geologist, um, interpreting that information, that, that's the goal, all right? Uh, the other thing you can do with LIBS is you can, you can actually quantify. Um, so you're getting the spectral signatures, but you can also determine intensities, which basically means integrating the peaks around those spectrum, those spectra, and then, you know, so you can get quantitative analysis of various elements, uh, you name it. Again, it, it'll, it can be set up to measure any element in the periodic table. The key is though you, your calibration, if you go to the step of quantification, your calibrations, they have to be somewhat matrix matched to the rock. You can't just take a, I don't know, again, I mean, an igneous rock and, and use that on calibration and use that on any other rock you might find, all right? So I just learned the word igneous this morning on the flight here, so anyway, and then so that's kind of where, so, so we're, I guess the, the message is we're getting there. I mean, right now, um, we can 
find the spot, we can hit the spot, which we couldn't do with x-ray or near-infrared, and we can get a, an elemental spectrum, and, um, and we can match it to a library. So now we're in the process of saying, okay, that's great to do in a lab or somebody with a limited number of materials, but now we're at the point where we're getting these out into the field and trying to do this in the real world of exploration. So that's, that's, that's going to be the excitement for the, for the coming months. Um, the other thing that I think is very interesting about the laser, and this goes right to the heart of the small beam, is this is a, well, this is sort of a poor resolution image uh, that you see on the camera. But um, if you want to analyze, let's say, that spot, this is the, this is the light that's going to show where the laser is going to hit. Um, this is a classic example of, uh, for, that's really, uh, gold exploration is a great one. So people that are, uh, geos that are doing gold exploration that are using x-ray, they've learned to use pathfinder elements, right? So antimony, tellurium, tungsten, elements that if they see those, it probably means there's a gold mineral or a gold containing mineral, whatever you guys would call it, is there. And the reason they do that is because with x-ray, um, you're looking for less than a typically, from what I've been told, a grand per ton or so, roughly less than a ppm of gold. Well, with x-ray, if you're, if you're interrogating a, a large sample size and there's a little bit of gold mineral there, it's this big dilution, right? You, so you, the x-ray is seeing this whole volume, but the thing you really want to see is a really tiny little spot. So it, it really dilutes the signal by, you know, five, rough calculation, 5,000 or more. Um, however, with the laser, if you can act, since, since the, the laser lets you actually go in and target and hit a certain spot, then you get just the signal from that mineral. So that big dilution effect goes away. And there's, I have an example of I wouldn't have mentioned that, but I have an example later. So here's where we are today. We think we can map minerals and ID them. That's what we think. And I have a couple of examples to show how we do that today. Um, and the next step is the quantification step. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so what we can do today, according to my biz dev guy, and I, I think sometimes he tells me this just so he keeps his job, because it, every six months he tells me the same thing we can do. So what we can do today is we can, like I said, find a mineral in a rock, shoot it with the laser, fingerprint it to, to know what mineral it is, um, and we can also throw that data into one of these off-the-shelf um, um, third-party software packages like, like, Reef, like IO Gas or, or TSG to also analyze it. Um, that's what we can do today. What we're working on is handling mixtures of minerals and quantification of minerals. That's, that's the next step that we're just embarking on. So this is an example of what you can see right on the handheld analyzer on the display. So this is an image so let's suppose you're looking at a rock. This is a real rock. And you're looking at a rock and you see this, this um, whatever you want to call it. I call it a vein, but I don't, that may not be your vernacular, but I call it a vein. So you shoot that vein. You can shoot it all along. You can, and you, the analyzer does a, a grid pattern. It moves the laser around. It, it, hits, it, it, it hits 16 by 16 spots, each for a couple of seconds. So it's about... I mean, it's for about a half a second. So it's about a 30 second or so test. And it, it rasters the laser around and at each spot it gets a spectrum. So each, at each location it gets a spectrum and it does, the, it does analysis of what elements it sees. And if you don't have calibration curves, it just does raw intensities in terms of, um, you know, high intensity, you know, high peak, low peak, medium high peak by color code. So you can imagine you shoot this thing and what you see, then what it produces right on the analyzer for you that you can page through are various maps in that rock of various elements. So um, this one in particular, so red and orange means high concentration, high, so it's a heat map, right? Red and orange is high concentration, blue is, is noise. So you can see, again, I don't know how excited anybody is about measuring carbonate, but um, it was a good example to show that 
if you do that, you can really see in that section of the rock where you have this, this vein here is a carbonate vein. And um, outside of that, you know, maybe there's some iron on each side, maybe a little potassium, some, some aluminum, but um, that's it. So that is something that has gotten the attention and interest of a lot of the exploration community. Sorry, Don, how big a yeah. scale is that? How big is that square? That's about a, yeah, that's about a three by three millimeter. It's quite small. Yeah. So. Can you do it bigger? Um, well, yeah, if you make the, you have to make everything bigger because the laser is rashed around in a rectangular pattern. And the thing about laser is the laser has to be, the laser has to focus right on where it's going to hit the sample because you take that laser, you focus it down. It's kind of like a magnifying glass in the sunlight. You focus it down and that gives, that puts all that energy into a very small point to vaporize the material. So yeah, so you, you're somewhat limited to, to a, uh, we could make it a little bigger. You could go to five or six by six millimeters, but you, you, you can never really go to, you know, several centimeters. What, not no, kind of, yes, sir. Could you create an array of these devices for those? Sure. And yeah. then feed a conveyor and analyze what's coming in? Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about how much money I've spent so far to get to this handheld. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could. You could do it and you could time together and pull the data from each one. That's, you could absolutely do that. Uh, the, only, the, the main challenge there to that problem is um, because the laser has to be focused, it has to come to a focal point where it strikes the material. You have to have some control over the distance from the device to the actual material. But, but that's done a lot. There's, a whole, there's a, a whole technique called standoff libs, which is shooting something at distance and analyzing it. That's more of a military application right now than mining, but, um, but you could. Um, and this is another, it's not a very good poor resolution picture, but this is another example of, um, of uh, okay, how do you guys say that, arsenopyrite? Yeah, not bad? All right, now I know another mineral. Excellent. <clears throat> I can say more than dolomite now. Um, another example is looking at a heat map where you can then see, you know, where in that part of the rock or that is the arsenic, sulfur, iron, for example. Composition. So, um, and here's another one. Again, my uh, colleague Andrew, his... Uh, this was, he wanted this one, he wanted to talk about this one, this, what he called sulfide speciation in gold. So this is a good example. Uh, if you would have taken this rock and shot that rock with an x-ray, you never would have seen the gold concentration because it's too low, you're looking over a big area. But the laser, because it's just hitting the exact, you know, it's, it's because the laser is only about 100 microns in diameter, it's actually hitting that spot on the rock that had the gold containing mineral. So you get a really high and clear signal for the gold there. Um, so this is, what's, this is what's going on right now where we can figure out what elements are present. Um, we can figure out roughly how much, if you put in calibration curves, you can get to percentages or PPM. And we can match to a, we can match that spectral information and get the, a name of a mineral. Um, the next step in this process, like I said earlier, is trying to handle real-world mixtures of minerals and also to try to have the analyzer spit out information that doesn't require a PhD geologist to say, no, 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 your, your algorithm is going off in the wrong direction. You have to, it's, it, we're not, we're, we would never see this mineral with this mineral. So there's a lot of that sort of, you know, tribal knowledge in this field that we're trying to capture into the algorithm. Anyway, so that's, that's one big area we're working on. The other big area we're working on is, with, and this has been going on a little longer and with a little more, and, and I won't say more success, it's just further down the road of development, is looking at elements that are not, cannot be analyzed by any other handheld technique in the field. And the big ones are essentially hydrogen through sodium. So, the, and the big ones of those being lithium, 
sometimes boron, sometimes beryllium, sometimes carbon, sodium, fluorine, a few others. So um, this is just, actually this, this study is, and I can give you the link, this is published on the Australian Stock Exchange, a company called Lithium Australia has these analyzers operating in their lithium mines generating the data. So all this, everything here is public domain stuff. It's been out there for a while. Um, so they're not so much interested in microanalysis. They're interested in knowing right on the spot how much lithium is in their mineral because there's no other technique that can do that in the field, right? The only other way to do it is take that sample, send it to a lab and wait. The reason is because X-ray, handheld X-ray cannot measure those really low atomic number elements. So lithium is a great one. Lithium is in high demand. It's been a nice, nice application to work on while we're working on all this other microanalysis um, applications. So um, there's some data from, from the, so what they're trying to do is to, just to show that that technique could be useful is they, in their exploration, they were taking samples, they were uh, homogenizing them, they were pressing them with, a ref with the, press, the portable field press that Reflex makes, and they would test them with the, the, libs the handheld that we have, and then they would get them, send them off to a lab for analysis. And what they really were after here was trending. So sometimes people say, well, what's the accuracy of this device? And I said, you know, if you have a properly prepared sample and a good calibration, it's generally sort of in that 15 to 20 percent range, which is pretty much what you see here. There's a few points where the uh, orange is the uh, handheld and the, and the blue is the, the lab data, where, where the, the orange is a little, the, it might be more than that 15 or so percent. But in general, it's pretty good correlation. And more importantly, the trend is where. That's what they're really looking for is how well, how, how strong is the, is the trend. So that's been a good application for lithium. There's all their data just showing on a typical scatter plot of lab versus laser. Um, and I spell that right, yeah. And that's a picture of the press that they use, a little field press. It's important if you press it, you compact it, the laser hits it. You get a lot more signal because you have a lot less air in the sample if you press it down to make it compact. And that's a little, I think, five ton press with a hand crank. So. Anyway. anyway, so that's really, that's really where we are right now. So uh, conclusion-wise uh, is that um, I say of the, you know, so, so the, the, the long-term goal is in-field mineral quantification. I would say the, we're, we're step, of the two steps I see in that process, step one being can you analyze all the elements and can you ID the mineral, that's largely been shown to be possible. Now we're starting to get out in the field because there's always an surprises in the field versus a controlled study. And trust me, they're never good surprises. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, and so, so I say that, we're in mound barking on step two, which is really the quantification of mixture step. So, and there's some papers that'll be coming out over the next six to 12 months on that. Um, and the other thing that we've really shown, and I would say it's a little more further up the adoption curve, is that um, you can do direct measurements of some of these important light elements that you could not do with any other technique. Again, that's moved a lot quicker because there's demand to measure things like lithium in the field, and there hasn't been a field technique to do so. So um, the end users are willing to take a bigger bet on that technology um, because it's something they can't get right now. And we're also doing brines. I just wanted to, th we, there's a, quite an active um, field testing underway now uh, for doing bri lithium brines as well, which is fairly straightforward. You just have to, the difference is presenting a liquid sample to the laser, which is simply a small fixture. Um, and that's it. <laughs>